The Stanley Cup Finals are bringing together two teams with very different histories. We'll get the stories on and off the ice with ESPN's Emily Kaplan. Plus, we're getting a report live from Golf's U.S. Open, Paramount is back to square one, and Nike was denied a trademark. It's Thursday, June 13th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Paramount, the parent company of CBS, has once again come close to a deal and said, never mind. Sherry Redstone, who owns 77% of Paramount Parent National Amusements, pulled the plug on a $1.7 billion offer for her stake from Skydance Media. A spokesperson for National Amusements said that they had, quote, not been able to reach mutually acceptable terms. Whatever that disagreement was, it sounds like it wasn't on the basic finances of the deal. The two sides had agreed on economic terms, so apparently there were other issues that were significant enough to scuttle this. What happens now is anyone's guess. Paramount could entertain other offers. However, after turning down Sony and now Skydance in quick succession, potential buyers will want to know what it's going to take to get a deal done. Paramount could also look to sell off some assets and potentially merge Paramount Plus with another streaming service and continue on under its current leadership. According to the Wall Street Journal, the most likely path is that Redstone looks for a sale of national amusements without trying to merge Paramount with another media company. Nike has been denied a trademark in the European Union for the term footwear. And in an audio medium like this one, you would say, of course, they can't trademark footwear. That's not unique to Nike. It's not even unique to shoes. That just means anything you put on your feet. But Nike wasn't trying to trademark the word footwear the way it's regularly spelled. They wanted footwear with the wear part spelled like software or hardware. Puma led the charge against the trademark, arguing that a significant number of people are not going to process the difference between footwear and footwear. And I think they have a point there. Nike can still appeal the decision. And finally, an ex-account called MLB Raleigh, dedicated to the idea that there should be an MLB team in Raleigh, North Carolina, produced a map that shows an interesting geographic contrast between the epicenters of amateur baseball versus professional baseball. If you draw a circle with a radius of 800 miles, with the center somewhere in western South Carolina, that area will encompass seven of the eight College World Series teams. North Carolina, NC State, Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Florida, and Florida State are all in the circle, and only Texas A&M is out. In that same circle, there is only one MLB team, the Atlanta Braves. If you made the circle a little bit larger, you pick up Cincinnati, and shortly after that, you bring in Baltimore, D.C., Tampa, Miami. So there is some arbitrary line drawing here. But it's a fair point that Atlanta has a ton of territory to itself. That will likely change when MLB expands. Nashville is a frontrunner to get a club. Charlotte, Orlando, and yes, Raleigh will be considered as well. PGA Tour golfers and live golfers are coming together in Pinehurst, North Carolina for the U.S. Open. Joining me now from Pinehurst is Front Office Sports Newsletter co-author David Rumsey. Welcome, David. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. I uh, hope you can see and hear me okay here in the media center if our Wi-Fi is working, but here at the U.S. Open. Yeah, great to have you live on scene. So we're speaking before the tournament has begun. What's the scene like there uh, so far? Yeah, on the ground, tons of fans. It's very hot here in Pinehurst, North Carolina. I think it's going to be a great tournament on the course. And then, of course, as you mentioned, there's going to be PGA Tour players, other players, and live golf players. There's 12 live members playing here this week. And uh, it's only the third time this year that we've got to see PGA Tour and live golfers play together at the major championships. And I think it'll be a good one. And yeah, on those lines, you were just at a press conference with some USGA execs. Um, what do they have to say about uh, sort of the future of, of you know, these live golfers and, you know, if they'll be able to participate going forward as they slip further and further down the rankings because they're not getting a- official points? Yeah, it's a good question because I think a lot of people, especially just casual golf or sports fans, aren't really sure of what the status of live golfers are. And, Let's make no mistake about it. They're not banned from competing at major championships like they're banned from competing on the PGA Tour, but they don't get world ranking points by playing in live golf. So it's hard for them to keep up their world ranking status. And therefore, they have to either participate in the open qualifying to get into a tournament like the U.S. Open or have won a recent major championship like Brooks Kepka or John Rahm, those type of big stars. So a lot of people have been saying, hey, why can't live golf have an easier path to get some of their top players in without having to make them go through the qualifying process. And Mike Wan, who's the CEO of the USGA, was asked a question about that. And he said, yeah, I mean, by all means, we're an open competition. Anyone can play if they want to and they get in. But 
he did go on to add that if in future years this kind of divide and fall continues, the USGA is going to think about and explore ways to potentially offer some spots to live golfers just by competing on their tour. Maybe he didn't say what, maybe that's like the top five uh, in the tour or something like that. But in future years, there could be a pathway for live golfers to get into a championship like the US Open. And speaking of the, the, the divide that continues on a year after, you know, a deal or a, a deal to make a deal was announced. Um, Tiger Woods recently had some sort of optimistic if rather vague comments on you know the most recent talks between uh, PGA Tour people and uh, Saudi Arabia uh, public investment fund officials um, anything new there yeah I, I heard his comments yesterday uh, on Tuesday and uh, it was interesting to me because he was a little bit more open a little bit more optimistic than he has been in the past kind of coy previously about yeah uh, you know we're working on it et cetera, et cetera. you know he said that a recent meeting last Friday between uh, PIF officials, PGA Tour officials, um, said they were talking about in-game scenarios and different ways to get there. He didn't say, hey, we're going to be there in one month, two months, three months. But he, he did sound optimistic and, you know, he kept preaching, you know, we all want the same thing. So it's better than going backwards, that's for sure. Yeah, right. That's, <laughs> that's progress at this point. Um, you have also, you wrote about the course itself. They're playing on Pinehurst number two. Uh, what, what makes this course unique? Yeah, it, it's a very uh, old course and the USGA just started coming here in 1999 and they've hosted uh, several US Open since then, 2005, uh, 2014. And now they're going to be hosting a lot of US Opens here, uh, 2024 right now, 2029, several more times in the next uh, two and a half decades or so. It's because Pinehurst is one of three anchor sites for the USGA and the US Open, along with Pebble Beach in California, which people are probably very familiar with, those iconic views there, as well as Oakmont, another iconic course in the US. And that means the USGA is gonna be coming back here over and over again, similar to kind of how the uh, Open Championship over in the UK and Scotland does it. They've only been to 14 courses ever since 1860 or whenever the first Open Championship was. People call it the British Open. Um, the U.S. Open has been to more than 50 courses. And I think now the USGA is going to start uh, kind of bringing that number down and getting people more familiar with uh, sites on a regular basis. And as the tournament kicks off, uh, are there any particular narratives that you're following yeah, for this U.S. Open? Yeah, I think an interesting thing uh, just uh, off the course is, is the money. They increased the purse to uh, $21.5 million this year, up from $20 million last year. Certainly, uh, that, that's no slouch, right? But it's not the biggest purse in golf. That's uh, the Players' Championship, which is $25 million, as well as live golf tournaments that are also $25 million. And if we go back to pre-COVID uh, in the 2010s, uh, the U.S. Open was pretty much always the biggest purse in golf. It would kind of one up the Players' Championship or the other major championships. Of course, there was no live golf to compete with. Um, in, in the press conference on, on Wednesday, you know, I asked Mike Juan, I said, is there any ambition to return that the U.S. Open to that status of the richest purse in golf? And he kind of said basically no. Um, if, you, if, if we keep one up, up in some other tournaments, they'll one up us. Uh, and so they're kind of content, uh, it sounds like, where they are. And certainly whoever wins this week, probably Scotty Shuffler, right? $4.3 million for the winner. So uh, I don't think anyone will be complaining about that sign. Yeah, no, if, even if they have complaints, you know, they, they can give it to me and I won't complain. Uh, David Rumsey, thanks so much for joining us on yeah, the show. I'll, yeah, same here. I'm joined now once again by ESPN NHL reporter Emily Kaplan. Welcome, Emily. Thank you, Owen. Always a pleasure chatting with you. Great to have you back on. So uh, we're two games into the Stanley Cup final. Um, other than the Panthers are a very good hockey team, what, is, what has stood out to you so far? Yeah, I mean, it's a celebration always of two different markets. You know, Canada having that thirst of not having a Stanley Cup in more than three decades now. Uh, the last time a team won was before Connor McDavid was born. So I'm really excited to see this crowd in Edmonton, uh, which is just so thirsty and loud. And I've been told just to prepare myself of what it's going to be like. And then 
Florida, which has emerged as a hockey market. I mean, for so long, we always talked about this team as struggling to fill their building. It's really big, more than 18,000. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, you know, 35 minutes from Fort Lauderdale. It's like a big mall parking lot that borders the Everglades, literally. Um, but they've done such a good job since they've been winning now of building this fan base in South Florida. Um, and they have true Panthers fans now. I know it's kind of become a punchline, but I go down there and people care about this team. So that's been a big storyline. And then just on the ice, I think it's been incredible that here in the U.S. we've been able to market Connor McDavid and let everybody know this is a really big deal. This is a generational superstar. You want to pay attention to him and you want to root for him to reach his quest of winning the Stanley Cup. And in Florida, um, the fact that they can emerge um, and they can produce superstars down there. Sasha Barkov now kind of becoming a name here in the U.S. because of how he shut down so many star players in these playoffs. And Matthew Kachuk, who's just been so willing to put himself out there, put his personality out there in ways that the NHL needs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like Kachuk was like, even before the Panthers had like really reached this level, was already kind of like a name that I would hear like even outside of hockey circles. He somehow like captured everyone's imagination and yeah i would love for mcdavid to just like at least like take over a game or two here just so people can can see what he can do um you would say the panthers are an example of like if you build a winner like people will show up i know this doesn't happen every single time but um is is it kind of as simple as they've they've put up a consistently good team they've been to the cup twice in a row now looks like they have a pretty good shot at winning this one um is it just that they're winning and people want to see that? A hundred percent. I don't think we have to overcomplicate it. It reminds me a lot of the Los Angeles Kings where when they're good, the market is really engaged, but you have so many competing entertainment options in the market of LA or South Florida that it's like, why would we pay attention to a team that's just kind of meh? Um, but when I talk to the Panthers and their business departments about when they've seen this growth, it all dates back to two years ago when they won the President's Trophy. They had that sick team that was scoring so many goals, and then they make it all the way to the Stanley Cup final last year. And then this year they're reporting, you know, attendance is up like significantly. Corporate sponsorships have more than doubled. Um, the correlation literally comes from the ice to the people that are paying money um, to watch this team, to support this team. So. Um, yeah, it, it it all goes hand in hand, and I don't think we need to like come up with more complicated answers than that. And yeah, so there, there's the Florida market, which yeah, they've only been a team since somewhere in the '90s, right? And so obviously not not a long hockey history compared to some teams like the Oilers that you know had Gretzky and were like the dominant team of some part of I I'm, didn't look this up ahead of time, but like they kind of dominated the '80s, I think because they had Gretzky and Messier and other players. Um, I know we haven't seen a game in Edmonton yet, but I'm wondering if you can just like, if there's like a vibe difference in terms of like what each market is feeling like right now. Yeah, I mean, Florida, the games have been one big party. Um, it definitely has this like South Florida flair. Um, I know everyone's making a really big deal when I do the coaches interviews, there's a little Florida man in training of the little shirtless kid who's flexing his muscles. Um, and you get a lot of that at the arena. Here in Edmonton, I haven't covered games here since the bubble, which obviously there were no fans, but the visuals and the anecdotes that I'm getting are, this is a market that is so fully engaged. This is a market that's really important to the NHL too. I mean, they're top 10 in hockey related revenue. Like they bring in a lot of money. And I think that there's such a story tradition because of that dynasty, um, like you said, that Wayne Gretzky, and Mark Messier, and all of those Hall of Famers engineered, but there's such a bridge to that dynasty too. Wayne Gretzky is still pretty involved with the team. Um, you know, when they went through their coaching change in November, one of the biggest hires that I don't know if it's getting enough love is they asked Hall of Famer Paul Coffey, who's already advisor to the team, like, we need you behind the bench. Like, you were a defenseman that meant so much to us. Like, we need you leading these defense. And like, he did even small things. Like, he looked around the locker room and was like, on our dynasty teams, all the defensemen sat next to each other and that helped with communication. Why isn't that way? Let's move their lockers next to each other. And he's encouraging them to play the same way he did, which is to make plays. So I think that there's just the story tradition and they have really done a good job of honoring their past. And maybe they were too fixated on the past for so long. And that's why maybe they fell out of favor. Sometimes it's just hard to sustain that success. But one playoff appearance in 13 years then gives you three lottery wins in six years. And once you get those number one picks, you can build around it. You get a generational player like Connor McDavid, and you get Leon Dreisaitl. And all of a sudden, we've built a winner back again. 
yeah, like we've been saying, Canada has not won a Stanley Cup since the Canadians won in 1993, the Montreal Canadiens. Um, it's sort of, it almost feels like when Andy Murray was trying to win Wimbledon, where it's like, it's not just like this team would yeah, obviously really wants to win. It's like a nation is like, please like, end and this like horrendous streak. Can you feel that at all yet? I mean, I know it's still the day before um, an actual game is played in Edmonton, but is there any, any, can you, you get a sense of that? Like uh, a hungry nation? Yes and no, because as much as it is this pride in Canada, and this is Canada's sport, Edmonton's biggest rivalry is, rivalry is Calgary. Like the Calgary people, I don't necessarily think are rooting for their big battle of Alberta uh, rivals there. Um, Vancouver, they went through a massive battle in these playoffs. Like I don't think people in Vancouver are necessarily rooting for Edmonton. Zach Hyman is from Toronto, played for the Maple Leafs. He said at the beginning of the series, like, trust me, I don't think people in Toronto are. I think there's a lot of people in this country that are rooting for McDavid. Uh, there's a lot of kids that look up to him. You know, he's their singular star. They want to see him achieve that goal. The media presence and the energy around a Canadian team is here. But I think if we went around and pulled Canada, maybe there's hatred for Florida, um, especially with their tax situation. Everyone thinking, oh, wow, they're probably getting um, some advantages. And that's probably the reason why Florida-based team has been in the Stanley Cup finals for five consecutive years now because they get some uh, advantages here in the salary cap because their dollar goes a lot further than it does in Canada when they're taxed uh, way higher. So maybe that'll compel people to root for Edmonton more. But if anything, I think they're just watching a really good hockey series. Let's zoom out a little bit to the rest of the NHL. So Gary Bettman, so the league is coming off a banner year in terms of like viewership and attendance. This was this was the best they've had in a long time. Um on the heels of that, Gary Bettman said there's plenty of interest in expansion, but they haven't opened a formal process around that yet. Pretty normal stuff for a commissioner to say, but it's also like in the background, we have the Arizona situation where there could be a, an added team if Alex Marullo can get his act together and uh, find an arena. And what is the, I forget the term to like reanimate the, the, the franchise. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I'm just wondering how you took his comments. I think that it feels like an inevitability at this point um, that the NHL wants to expand, that there are so many markets that are engaged and they've tapped out in Canada in terms of interest. Like, I don't know how many more hockey fans in Canada you can activate or engage, but here in the U.S., um, it's a sleeping giant and there's so many markets that stepped up when Arizona was having issues like, hey, what about us? What about us? The reason they went with Utah is because they had an owner who was so prepared to get things up and running quickly. Um, that's Ryan Smith, who's just becoming a model owner in the sense of embracing tech and new wave technology. And, you know, that market has already shown a lot of strength with uh, the jazz, but they want to go back to Arizona. Like that is now the number one desirable market for the NHL to go back to. And we'll see if Morello will be able to win this land auction that he told the NHL he intends to win at the end of the month. If not, maybe they find another owner that can put a team there. But I'm telling you from Kansas city to Cincinnati, Quebec city is always looming. You know, Hartford's always looming. There's plenty of markets around here that want an NHL team. And I think these owners are seeing the expansion price and what it could be, um, what Ryan Smith was willing to pay, how much more they can now engage. You know, Vegas paid 500 million, Seattle paid 650 million. They're going to be well over a billion for the next expansion fee. We'll divvy that up amongst the teams. Like these owners are going to want it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is Atlanta still in the running? I feel like it's it's always mentioned as like a big city that, that's had an NHL franchise before, but they've already kind of messed it up a couple times. So like, I mean, not like the city itself messed it up. But anyway, is, um, do you think that history helps or hurts? I think it hurts in the term of a narrative, but I think that if I looked at which markets would be front runners right now. Atlanta's right up there and they actually have two competing ownership groups who are trying to get a team up and running there right now. So I'd say Atlanta, Houston, Kansas City, Arizona. Like those are the four that are probably on the forefront for the NHL. And if you look at all of those markets, you know, they're ones that are growing and have a more diverse fan base and and more culturally engaged than some of the ones that we've been, you know, associated with the NHL for so long. So those would be the ones I'd keep an eye on. Yeah, yeah, it feels like we're like kind of tapped out on like the northern U.S. and I guess Canada. I mean, obviously you can always find more markets. I guess Quebec is is not a 
um, doesn't have a team. I think the Montreal Canadiens would have something to say if they wanted to add a team in Quebec City. Just as I think Hartford, one of the biggest issues there is like, do you think the Rangers are going to allow that? Or, you know, all of those teams that are clustered in that area, the Rangers have their farm team in Hartford. Like they kind of stick their ground there. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, salary cap is going up four and a half million dollars to 88 million. Are we going to feel that in some way? Yes. Uh, we are. I, I think a lot of people are hoping that it can grow quicker. And a lot of people, I mean, hockey people and the players and the general managers who want to spend, but we saw so many teams squeezed. And I think the biggest area it manifested was this year at the trade deadline, where there were many teams that were like, we just can't get anything done because we're so tight against the cap. This gives them some flexibility. So I think we're going to get more player movement this summer at the draft is typically when we see some big blockbuster trades. And then throughout the season and the trade deadline, I think it's going to be a bit more exciting with more movement. So um, hockey fans are in for a treat. And from here, it's only going to go up. You know, it could have gone up bigger. The NHL did more conservative figures just, you know, to make sure things are steady and healthy and afloat. But I would expect the salary cap to increase now, um, you know, at maybe even similar percentages the next few years. And that's a great thing for our sport. Yeah. And hopefully we'll help the Oilers keep this core together because uh, they've, they've got some mega stars. Um, which teams do you think are going to, you know, be the ones maybe swinging a big draft day trade or, or yeah, we're just going to, you expect some activity sometime or another. And, uh, you know, as we you know, go through the off season. I'm in Canada right now and the hockey of the center universe is Toronto. And we know that it's unlikely they're going to keep this core together. Uh, they have to make some kind of changes. And it feels like the one player that would make the most sense to move would be Mitch Marner. The thing is Mitch Marner has his say here, but um, I would keep an eye on that situation. It feels like they're trying to, figure something out there and just shake up the chemistry of their team to finally get over that hump. Um, Boston is going to have to make some big moves, all eyes on Linus Allmark. They're probably going to try to engineer a trade for him. We know the New Jersey Devils are taking a big swing at a goalie. I expect them to be quite active. And then a lot of people are curious about like a team like Chicago where, okay, you got Connor Bedard, you got number two in the draft lottery this year can't be as bad as you were last year you need to start building this goodwill with the franchise again so i'm curious i don't think they're like swinging for the fences this off season but they're going to make some moderate moves uh to get things going along in their rebuild yeah i mean that's such an interesting market because they were so good and they, i mean they had like a little mini dynasty not that long ago and now they're so bad and um yeah do, do you have a uh a, any sense of like how long it's going to take for that team to like at least be a playoff team and maybe start, you know, making some noise with Bedard in the middle. I think two years from now, we're talking about them in the playoff conversation and three years from now, we're talking about them making a big push. Um, they have a ton of prospects. They've done a really good job building up the system. And if their prospects are as good as their front office thinks they are, right? Remember, every front office obviously loves their prospects because they're the one that drafted them. They think they're amazing. Um, all of these guys will age out at exactly the right time and form this dynamic young core around Connor Bedard. So I think we're looking at two, three years now, but a more competitive team next year for sure. And anything else that you're kind of keeping your eye on, uh, you know, as we go through these, the cup finals and into the off season. Yeah. Um, no, I, I just think it's such an exciting time for our sport. It really is the conversations and energy around our sport, especially here in the U S uh, have never been louder. Uh, the fans have been engaged. I think we're doing a good job of celebrating the history of our sport and what makes it great, but transitioning into a more modern media world. Uh, you know, I just met the top four prospects, at the draft they came they do this every year they bring them to a stanley cup final game and i was just blown away by the confidence of these kids that they're willing to put themselves out there they've got some swag themselves and that's what's been holding our sport back and it's what we love the sport right it's they're so deferential it's team identity team first we 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 um but we need a little me and that's why you know earlier we we're talking about matthew kachuk he's been on the forefront of that of not being able to put afraid to put himself out there so I'm excited uh, for this next generation and seeing what next year brings. All right, Emily Kaplan, thanks for saying the Devils are going to get a goalie, and thanks for joining us joining us on the show. Your Devils will get a goalie. I can't tell you who, but uh, they are 100% not leaving this offseason without one. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend or send this episode to the hockey fans in your life. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.